So welcome to the San Diego River Speaker Series, Amazing World of Bats, Nature's Tiny Fighter Jets with Don Endicott. Uh, we are very excited to have you here tonight for the first ever San Diego River Speaker Series. We are so excited because these mysterious creatures of the night are something that so many people talk about, so many people don't know about, and we are going to learn more about those from Don Endicott. Those are bats. My name is Jen, and I am a program manager at the San Diego River Park Foundation. For those of you who are not familiar with us, the San Diego River Park Foundation is an environmental nonprofit dedicated to the health of the San Diego River. So our vision is the completion of the San Diego River Park system from the mountains to the ocean. And as part of these efforts, we monitor our riparian wildlife and work to conserve important populations that call the San Diego River home. So some of these special local creatures include the bats uh, that we will be talking about tonight. So to kick off our evening, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of our staff members and our guest speaker of the night. So I think we can go ahead and stop sharing our welcome screen so that we can introduce our speakers. Awesome. Hello, hello. Uh, so first up, we have Marina, our community engagement manager at the San Diego River Park Foundation, who will be assisting with us tonight on our technical support. So on that note, you probably noticed that you're muted. And so this will help us to minimize any background noises during the presentation. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat. We will be monitoring the chat box for any issues or questions, and we'll do our best to answer those questions. And I will be relaying questions to Dawn. Uh, try to do my best in the order that they were received throughout the presentation. Then we will also have time at the end for additional questions. We are recording this presentation tonight to provide the link for those who are unable to join us. So if you would like, you do have the opportunity to turn off your video. Uh, I would also like to introduce Chase, our preserve coordinator. In just a minute, Chase will tell us about the ongoing research and conservation efforts happening through San Diego River Park Foundation and how you can help. Uh, and last but not least, we have our wonderful guest speaker tonight, Mr. Don Endicott. He's here too. And so Chase, take it from here. Welcome everyone. Um, and thank you for tuning in to our uh, San Diego River Speaker Series. Um, I'm gonna, I, like Jen said, I'm the preserve coordinator and, um, and I overlook and oversee our bat conservation programs that we do at the River Park Foundation and work closely alongside Don Endicott. And but I, before we we let Don take it over from here, I just wanted to give everyone some updates on uh, what's going on in the bat world with San Diego with our preserves and um, and some updates and some thank yous. So uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to thank. Um, anyone and everyone who helped uh, donate in our campaign last fall for uh, creating to, to allow us to establish a bat monitoring program and um, are a donor of our adopt a bat program. So um, thank you to those monthly donors. Uh, and if you guys are interested in uh, learning more and supporting our adopt a bat program and uh, bat conservation efforts, um, please see, uh, see the follow up email after this presentation or email um, our executive director. Uh, uh, let's see. And so a little update on uh, program updates. We successfully installed uh, a mine gate at one of our preserves. This is a big project, kind of kickstarted uh, our bat conservation efforts. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, our uh, bat biologist, Drew Stokes, at the entrance of the mine, uh, the, the entrance of the mine where we were, uh, recording and observing these bats um, and then the image to the to the right is the mine gate so this uh, just restricts any human uh, humans going uh, in and out and but still allows you know the wildlife and the bats to uh, freely come in and out of the cave uh, so far we've recorded a lot of bats and um, in a, the the top th three of or in the top four of the bats that are most prevalent on near uh, on our preserves 
are a uh, species of special concern, the pocketed free tail bat, the Mexican free tail bat, and the Townsend's big eared bat. Um, these are all uh, special stat species that um, either are have threatened um, populations or are um, have special conservation statuses. And we continue to, we're, we're continuing our bat monitoring program to extend to multiple preserves. And um, that is what we're planning to do uh, this spring. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Don Endicott. Don uh, is a retired research and executive uh, or research engineer and executive Navy communications and network technologies. Uh, Don's discovered a second career as a volunteer naturalist. He uh, is a NAI certified interpretive guide, Mission Trails Regional Park trail guide and public educator for the San Diego Natural History Museum and San Diego Humane Society BAT team. He also is a volunteer and advisor for uh, the San Diego Parks BAT research and conservation projects, uh, including his recent work at Boulder Creek with the Mine Gate. Um, and Don is a co-author of 50 Best Short Hikes in San Diego with the late Jerry Shod. Um, and Don's a very close friend of mine, and we've worked alongside doing BAT projects. And so um, I'm really looking forward to his presentation tonight. So with all, uh, with further ado, here's Don Endicott. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. All right, Don, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Chase and uh, Jen and Marina. Uh, welcome, everyone. Always a pleasure to have, have a chance to uh, share a little bit about this uh, rather mysterious creature for most folks. This started out as a um, a campfire presentation and for bat walks with Mission Trails, campfire talks out in Anza Borrego. Uh, so the prop situation is a little different. I'm going to start out with a few things to share with you, not necessarily in the regular order. Then we have some slides that will have some soundtracks and obviously visuals. I have some videos at the end. Uh, I will pause at some point I'll try to pause at some point in the middle for questions. We'll definitely have questions before I start the video. And I'll stick around as long as anyone has questions this evening. So first off, I'll grab one of my campfire talk critters. And this is a not to scale big brown bat. And it gives me the chance to talk about some of the characteristics that make a bat a bat. First of all, they're mammals. So they have fur. Uh, they give live birth, warm blooded. Uh, they happen to be the only mammal that flies. So think of gliding squirrels or sugar gliders, they're gliders. Um, and they also see at night with sound. So flying and echolocation are two of their signature features. I'll describe a little bit about their anatomy with this. This guy, well, this guy's a little big. So let me, yeah, we'll still do him. So bats are chiroptera, which means hand wing. So they fly with their hands. This is their thumb. These are two, first two fingers. So corresponding to those two fingers, third finger pinky. Um, and the fabric, the, the membrane between those joints is what allows them to fly, obviously, flapping their wings quite rapidly. Uh, another bit of their anatomy is their feet. This isn't actually very accurate. Let me grab another guy. This, this is the real size of a big brown bat. And actually, this is a real big brown bat. This is a specimen from the San Diego Natural History Museum. So you can see they're quite, this is a big bat, so it still fits in the palm of my hand. One thing about their feet, uh, their legs are rotated 180 degrees from ours. So think of your knees bending backwards and the balls of your feet facing forward. Uh, I usually do a quiz with, especially with kids, but that's not really feasible here. Uh, that's an, an adaptation for hanging and hanging and being able to fly out from, from a, a vertical service. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to share? Oh, I mentioned their wing, wing membrane. So this is a nitrile glove. 
on a little uh, darning ring. And so that's pretty much the consistency of a bat swing, maybe a little bit thicker than this particular glove. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about their bones. So this is a, a no longer flying bat specimen. Um, bats have solid bones, just like we do. Birds have hollow bones, keep the weight down. Bats solve that problem of weight by having very thin bones, they're also very flexible. So again, right up here, we have those first two fingers, thumb is up here in the, in the back. It's kind of hard to figure out on the TV. And uh, so that's, that's the bat's anatomy. With that, I'm going to shift and share my screen with our presentation. So hopefully, We'll see, uh, I'm going to open chat just so I can make sure if Jen or someone can confirm that we've got the screen looking okay. It looks sure. good, Don. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we've already had the title here, Tiny Fighter Jets. Why is that? Well, we'll hear, we'll hear about that shortly. So this is a quiz I give. Again, a little hard to do over Zoom to get question and answer, but questions are, bats are blind. Bats will attack you, bats will get in your hair, bats will suck your blood, all bats have rabies, bats aren't important to us. So guess what? All those are false. Bats actually, can, some bats can see very well, especially fruit bats in the, in the uh, Far East, Australia, et cetera, because they are out at daytime. But all of our bats are capable of seeing some better than others, but that doesn't do them a lot of good at night. Uh, bats will attack you. No, if you ever encounter a bat, it's either trying to get away from you, say it got in a confined space, somehow accidentally got into your house, or um, maybe it's flying around where you're walking because you're stirring up insects to eat. Bats don't try to get in your hair. We have three species of bats that do drink blood. Only the common vampire will on occasion uh, go for human blood. There are no common vampire bats north of about central Mexico, so not an issue, certainly in North America. Bats, like other wild animals, do have rabies. I think the estimates of the percentage are maybe half a percent, but there's a higher percentage likelihood of that if you see a sick bat on the ground. Uh, we'll talk later about, you know, don't touch, don't pick up, etc. And there are multiple reasons why bats are important to us. So I've already talked about some of these. Uh, what is a bat? This is a picture of a, a little brown bat, which has been in the news over the last decade, uh, severe declines due to white nose syndrome. But for now, it's just our poster picture here. Uh, fly, uh, hunt, search, navigate, uh, catch animals using uh, sound location, echolocation. Uh, babies burn, <coughs> babies, Nurse on mother's milk, so mothers have teats underneath the, uh, the wing area. Um, Chiroptera, this number is always out of date. How many species? The last I read in uh, my bat newsletter, 1400. So we're finding new bat species all the time. And look at that, a quarter of all mammal species are bats. The only larger group are rodents. Where do they live? Bats are largely a temperate and tropic uh, animal, uh, that's where the food is. But they also range all the way up to Alaska. Uh, Long-legged myotis, I've actually seen some up there, all the way to the tip of South America. But the largest number of species are in, uh, in uh, the, the tropical band. Some great names, uh, I always like the Old Norse one, leather flapper, how could it be more descriptive? And bald mouse, flying mouse, they're not mice, they're not rodents, but uh, you know, there you have it. We've already talked about the features. I'd point to the illustration on the right. See how our hand, the, the green, the fingers, those are right here, the tips, the yellow, the in, uh, uh, inner, more inner digits in the palm of your hand are here in yellow, and then the two parts of the arm bone. I've already mentioned about the fabric, uh, the membrane between the, the joints that they fly with. 
And this just shows you that you can actually see through them uh, to a degree. Uh, their head is very specialized. Uh, sometimes you see very elaborate uh, nose configurations. We have some uh, three species of leaf nose bat, uh, one that's somewhat common. Uh, and also ear shape, different sizes of ears. This is those all uh, adaptations for echolocating. So they make the sounds through their voice boxes and they process it through their ears. Uh, yeah, this is a pallid bat. We have them on the coast, although it's primarily a desert species. And I had occasion after a bat walk, uh, one researcher asked me if she could do a CT scan of a bat. Well, I came up with a skull from the museum. And let's just take a little look at how that looks. So the colors here are false color. This is, a, this is the same animal that's on the, on the left of your screen. Uh, the brightest color is bone density. So pallid bats have very strong jaws. Uh, they eat very hard shelled insects. And then also very dense are the cochlea, the inner parts of the ear, the bone structures. And that is uh, again, association with processing echolocation calls. How big are they? I showed you the big brown bat in my palm. Uh, we have a canyon bat on the right. You know, they're really tiny. Most of our bats are really tiny. I'm gonna show you, this, this is a canyon bat, a canyon bat with its wings out. And, and this is a canyon bat in the palm of my hand. So. Smallest bat in North America, also one of our more common bats. If you or see bats in the desert around twilight light, they're almost always canyon bats. Uh, these three are the most common species here in the metro San Diego area. So canyon bat used to be called Western Pipistrelle, Mexican free tail bats, and Yuma myotis. Uh, I won't go through all the specifics here. We have 22 species in San Diego County. 45 in North America. Sometimes they count some that get up into Florida. So I've seen counts of 47, but generally 45, 22 in the county. And we have the smallest, the canyon bat and the Western Mastiff bat. So the Western Mastiff bat, one of their roosts is over on El Cajon Mountain. I know Chase has done some uh, monitoring up there. So they have a 22 inch wingspan, quite a large bat. And here, for comparison. So I think my cursor shows up. Here's a canyon bat, the one I just had in my hand. Here's the western master bat. And you will definitely notice if you see a western master bat. What color are bats? Well, most of them are uh, LBJs, little brown jobs. Uh, but this, these are examples of very colorful bats here in San Diego County. So pallid bat, very white colored, the desert variety. Uh, hoary bat, sort of the designer, looks like a fashion model. Western uh, red bat on the left. Uh, and again, some really beautiful bats. And here are the three Lazarus genus species lined up. Uh, Dick Wilkins, a rehabilitator, one of the founding rehabilitators here in San Diego with Project Wildlife had occasion to do a little glamour shoot for the three. Bats have been around for quite a while, at least 52 million years. A little hard to find <coughs> fossils for something so tiny and fragile, but there have been some found. Uh, so they've been there since the beginning of mammals and largely with the same design they have now. So very successful design. Uh, maybe they went farther back. I believe birds, originated around 140 million years. So birds were got to the air first. Uh, but yeah, again, bats very successful design. Flight, we talked about, you know, only a mammal that can fly, uh, true flight. And they have a variety of uh, flying skills. The canyon bats, when you see them, they're pretty wobbly around. And if it's windy, they're going all over the place. Mexican free tail bats uh, aren't much bigger. Let's see. Got one here. This is a Mexican free tail bat. You can see his tail here behind. 
So they call it free tail. So again, not very big, but these little guys in Texas, these are the ones that are at Carlsbad Caverns, uh, Congress Street Avenue Bridge in Austin, Bracken Cave. They assemble in large nursery concentrations. And in the spring, during that nursery season, they're out foraging 35, 45 miles every night. Um, uh, uh, there's one thing that'll come up on a later slide, but I'll mention it now. This little bat can fly to 10,000 foot elevation. In fact, they do it in the, by the millions there in Texas. And uh, an, I guess an innovative researcher put a, a radio tag on four of them and followed them in an airplane and found that the fastest was able to fly 100 miles an hour, just a tick under 100 miles an hour. So amazing capability. Uh, what do they eat? Most of our bats are insectivores, the Vesper bats, and they eat a variety of insects, different species like different types of insects. Uh, the smaller bats would tend to go for gnat size or mosquito size insects. Uh, here on the right, we've got moth eaters. That's a Mexican free tail on the lower right. Uh, they, they're a generalist. They eat all sorts of things. We have a few nectar bats in the country, uh, one in San Diego County, the uh, Mexican long-tongued, uh, but it's pretty uh, a rare migrant. The, the nectar bats, however, are really important pollinators. Basically all of the cactus with white blooms and a, and a number of uh, natural fruits. And then our, our friend, the pallid bat here, we saw his skull rotating earlier. Beetles and scorpions are on their fare. They're, Apparently immune to uh, scorpion venom. They also like Jerusalem crickets. They're gleaning bats. We'll see a video about pallids uh, at the end. How do bats drink? I got this question after a talk or during a talk and I didn't know the answer. So I had to do a little research and went out and did some photography. Bats drink by, they don't land to drink. That would be too dangerous to make them, they would be vulnerable to predation. Uh, they fly over the water, uh, dip their lower jaw down and get a few drops at a time. Uh, sometimes they'll get it, the water, they'll skim the water and get it on their chest fur and then uh, lap that up from a roost site. So that's, uh, that's how bats drink. Echolocation, this is the part that really got me excited uh, early on because it's uh, really a remarkable capability. This is Lily. Lily is uh, recently deceased. She was an ambassador bat. She's a Western yellow bat. She was an ambassador bat, ambassador bat for Project Wildlife when we did outreach events. And we were up at San Alijo, I think uh, a Lagoon in Bloom event. Um, and I noticed she was echolocating. So I put my microphone in front of her and this, hopefully we can hear this. So on a spectrogram, it looks like this. We'll talk about this in a moment, but what a bat is doing, an echolocating bat, is it's squeaking very rapidly and very high frequency out of its uh, throat box larynx area. It sends out pulses and it listens for those pulses coming back. And I'll go into a little more detail. The frequency is generally above what we can hear. Lily's a 35,000 cycle a second bat. So her calls are 35 kilohertz and above. Human hearing tops out between 10 and 15, uh, except for older folks like me, where it's more like five or six. Uh, and uh, so in some ways it's very fortunate because what we're gonna see is bats are really loud acoustically. This little demonstration of them squeaking the pulses and hearing them come back. They have three kinds of calls in general. There's a search call, that's when they're navigating or sort of generally becoming aware of their environment. There's an approach call when they're getting close to a prey of interest. And then there's a terminal call, sometimes called the terminal buzz when they zoom in on that insect. I mentioned it's really loud. so. Some of the bats, Mexican free tails, pocketed free tail, actually a number of them 
are can are generally about as loud as if you were standing on a carrier deck during flight operations near the exhaust. So we're really not quite sure how they can tolerate that sound. Again, we don't hear it because it's so high. Uh, one thing that researchers did find is that bats close off their ears when they're emitting the sound and then release them. So they tense muscles in the, in the same, has the same inner three ear bones we do. They tense those so that they don't hear their own sound and then release it so they can hear it back. And this is all taking place in 10th of a second or less. I call them tiny, tiny fighter jets. Uh, their sonar is more sophisticated than anything our military uh, systems have. They're able to distinguish something the width of a human hair. They can catch, locate, and zoom in on moving targets the size of a gnat and do that repeatedly. Uh, some of them can hover. So, you know, you've got an osprey. Uh, I already mentioned the 100 miles an hour and the 10,000 foot elevation. So what capable uh, creatures these are. Life cycle, bat puppies are called pups. They're born blind and hairless. Again, I have a little video at the end. We'll see a birth. Uh, usually one per mother, one per year. So when, when we had the outbreak, when well, we're still in it, the outbreak of white nose syndrome, great uh, significant decimation of populations. They're gonna be slowly re slow to recover. It's one baby per mother. Although some bats, the Western red bat, can have up to four. Another amazing thing about bat babies is they're really huge. So think of having a 30 or 35 pound human baby and having to fly and carry it around before it's born and maybe carrying it around again after it's born if you need to relocate your roost. So really amazing. Four to six weeks, they learn to fly and are basically on their own uh, thereafter. Many hibernating caves, uh, we don't really have that. We have uh, that some that use mines, such as the Boulder Creek uh, property. Uh, there, our bats are more, they go into torpor. They go lower metabolism, sort of, you know, be off, off the eating grid for a couple of days, especially when it gets chilly, but they really never truly hibernate. Some migrate long distances. There are bats down in Mexico, the Mexican short-nosed and long-nosed that have to pollinate agave, and they've been found to fly 100 kilometers a night uh, to go to a particular agave patch and then fly back to, to feed their babies. They can live surprisingly long lives, 20 to 40 years. I think the longest is uh, 43 or 45. Compare that to a rodent that's uh, going to live, if it's lucky, a year and maybe a couple of years. Maternity nurseries. Um, by the way, uh, some of these slides say Brazilian free tail, Mexican free tail, that's actually Tadarida brasiliensis. It's the same species, but uh, common use uh, in our part of the uh, world is Mexican free tailed. 500 pups per square foot. And in Bracken Cave in Texas, not too far from Austin, 20 million mothers and 20 million babies in one cave. Carlsbad used to have a well over a million. Uh, last I heard, it's, uh, it's several hundred thousand. So that, that population is, is decreased, decreased over time. I imagine some of you have been to uh, Carlsbad. What a great event. Sit out there, everyone gets hushed. In the amphitheater outside the cave opening and suddenly the swallows that were there start morphing into bats and it just goes on and on and on. Uh, again, I mentioned hibernation. This is more uh, Midwest, East Coast, and Canada, Alaska. But they can lower their temperatures below freezing, uh, lower heart rate, almost stop breathing. Uh, so, you, you know, these bats, you say, well, they lived 20 years, but <laughs> half of it was asleep. Uh, but anyway, again, remarkable adaptations for times when there's no food. And some of them have been uh, migrating to these hibernacula, these caves for generations 
because they're safe harbor at, at uh, they have the right temperature and they don't have the threat of predators uh, when they need them. So 22 species of bat in the county. I won't go through the list. I color coded these. Again, I give talks from Mission Trails and Cabrillo, uh, Anza Borrego, and I happen to keep track of my, my, bat, my yard. So when we talk about acoustics, I'll talk about that a little more. But anyway, I'm in Scripps Ranch and to date, uh, 11 species. So half of the counties have at one time or another spent some time in my yard. And here's the rest of the list. Again, if there are questions, we can come back to some of these. So how do we record bat calls? Uh, basically, you've got an ultrasonic microphone and there are all sorts of different kinds. I'm showing you one that I began using it very convenient it's called the uh, echo meter touch. I know that uh, the River Park Foundation has some of these too. They're great for public education because you can see the bat call at the same time the bat's making the call. Connect to a PC or tablet. I usually ha have it with me, but it's they're about yay big. And it's got built in software and interpretation to help you narrow in on what species. And what I'd like to show you is how some of the bat calls vary. And hopefully the sound will be okay for you. I'm going to work my way down high frequency to low. So Yuma myotis, this is a small insect eater. Bat call frequencies have much more to do with what they're eating and where they spend their time than species. So bird calls, they're calling to identify themselves. The you know, males are saying, hey, I'm I don't know, I'm a, a gross beak and I'm available. But uh, bats, it's a utility. It, it tells you, in a sense, where they live and what they're eating. So a high frequency suggests a bat that's eating very small food. Otherwise, the echoes would, would go through them and not bounce back. So let's listen to a Yuma myotis. So human myotis is a 50 kilohertz bat. So again, 50,000 cycles and, and up. It actually sweeps down. And you heard a little whoop, whoop, whoop. That's a social call. So at lower frequency, sometimes they'll talk to each other. Uh, this is a canyon bat. That's that little bitty guy. It's like a metronome, 45 kilohertz metronome. Get this started here. Uh, now we're going to move down to the yellow bat. So we saw Lily earlier. Uh, one thing, a, sort of a disclaimer, this is an artificial sound rendition made by the software in, uh, in this case, the echo meter application. If we could hear it, it would, it would sound like static, a pulsed static. But this is a lot, uh, I guess, easier on the ear. And you can learn to recognize these so you don't even have to look at your screen. You can tell which bats are flying around. So let's look at a yellow bat. And next we have Mexican freetail bat. So Mexican freetails are a generalist, they'll eat small medium, large insects on the wing, uh, tend to like moths. Therefore, they have a lower frequency. So this is my World War II submarine movie simulator bat call. And finally, Mexican freetails as generalists have all sorts of different calls. So this is the standard one. And uh, so sometimes they can be a little tricky to identify if you're not seeing them when they're making their calls. And finally, the pallid bat, we saw this one earlier, they're a, more a listening bat. 
a greener, so they're much quieter. And sometimes you have to, I'm going to, on this upper scale, I'm going to turn up the multiplying factor so we can actually see that. And sometimes it's a party. They're eating different foods. So this is out in uh, Brago Springs near the campground. And I've got three different species all at the same time foraging together, uh, apparently rather harmoniously. Oh, let me just describe a little bit. I skipped that. This is frequency on the left-hand side in kilohertz, so 1,000 cycles a second. Human hearing goes up to about 15, so below any of these. And this is thousands of a second along the horizontal scale. Uh, this, is, this is compressed. It took out the gaps between the calls. The calls tend to be like every tenth of a second or so. So we're getting close to, well, actually, before I do culture, Jen, how are we doing on questions? So we had a couple of questions. I think this one goes along really well with what you were just talking about. Uh, do the different species have different types of echolocation and how do they discern their surroundings if there's a group of subats each performing their own echolocation with their own clicks? Oh, those are great questions. So let's see if I can remember them in order. The, uh, well, let me go backwards. So bats, if they're the same species and they're hunting at the same time, sometimes one will lower or, the, or, or one will raise or they'll both shift their frequency so they're not hearing each other. Uh, another thing that they can do, uh, well, another aspect is the range isn't all that long. So especially when they get the terminal buzz, when they're, you know, the brrr, when they're catching an insect, that's really close in front of them. Uh, having said that, some uh, innovative researchers studied some calls of the bats coming out of the big caves and discovered that some of those necks and free tails actually jam each other. So, you know, I want that bug, I'm gonna go send you on a, on a deceptive call over here and I'm gonna go get it. Um, what was, there was another question there at the beginning that I kind of I missed. How did they know? Oh, wow, that's you know? very cool. Yeah, so we had uh, the second part of that question and then we had two other questions after that. Uh, the second part of that question was, I, and you covered this a little bit, uh, do the different species have different types of echolocation? Yes, the, the species, you can differentiate many of the species by the frequency range and knowing what lives in your area. Uh, but bats have three basic calls. One is called the uh, search. Um, so it's a long, flat call. That's the kind of call that's going to bounce off trees or houses or cars or people standing in their way. So it's generally a low, and it might be a, 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 a relatively louder call, so it, it goes farther. Uh, then they have an approach call. The approach call is when they're shortening the frequency, they're looking for something that they're interested in. So they're not avoiding things, they're attracted to things. And then when they get very close, they're gonna increase the frequency, they're sweeping it, uh, uh, and they're gonna increase the frequency and they're going to speed it up. And so you've got, let's say you've got a, something the size of a gnat flying in front of a bat and it's obviously not interested in being eaten, it's moving all over. And the bat is homing in and more pulses, higher frequency to, to get it. So there are frequency differences due to species and what they're doing. The last thing I'll mention, not to drag it out, is it depends on where they live. So, and it's called clutter. So if you have a free space bat, which is what the free tails generally are, they're gonna have nice, smooth, long calls. If you're in forest, like hoary bats, uh, red bats, uh, fringe myotis, they're going to have a steeper, more, uh, I guess the, the description is, they're going to sweep more frequencies because they have more things to avoid. And all this time, they're flying. So you had two more questions? Awesome. 
Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so the first one was, I think they're talking about the Mexican free-tailed bat, but they said the Mexican bat with the tail is neat. Why does it have a tail and how many other bats have tails? Well, all bats have tails. The free-tailed bat is because it, its tail extends, I'm not sure if this is showing up on the camera, it extends beyond the, the tail membrane. Other bats, I mean, it's basically a mammal. Some of them are very short. Some of them don't even reach the edge of the membrane. Uh, so it's a mammal, it's got a skeleton and they have some form of, of tail. Uh, what was there another part to that question? Um, how many, you, you answered it. Why, well, why does it have a tail? But you kind of answered that along with it too. It also gives some structure to the tail, which is, you know, kind of like a rudder when they're flying. We'll see in the video how they use their tail to scoop up insects. Woohoo! That's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> um, and then there was a question, what is White Miller syndrome? Okay, so white nose syndrome, we'll talk about that in the next section. It's a fungus that uh, basically interrupts hibernation and is causing large die-offs of bats, especially on the east and up in Canada. So yeah, we'll cover that one in a bit. All right, and then we have a, we can um, move on and then we'll, or there's a quick question. The same, are these the same relative populations of bats in Northern California or Oregon? Um, we have more in San Diego County. We're closer to Mexico, so we're more temperate. The farther north you get, the colder it is, the fewer species that have adapted to that. So when I visit our, our son and daughter-in-law in, -law in uh, the Seattle area, or I, I record up as far as Alberta so far, there are only one or two handful of species up there, whereas we have the 22. If you went down, I think, um, places like Costa Rica, Central America, you might have over 100 in the same space as San Diego County. All right. Thank you, Don. OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about bats and human culture, creatures of the night, mysterious, often associated with death and the underworld. Um, and we have there some examples from uh, pre-Columbian cultures. Membrous culture, that's uh, Southwestern Indian. Uh, very good uh, observers of wildlife I actually have a replica of a similar bowl right here. Never gonna have enough bat paraphernalia. Uh, but on the far right, we have the coat of arms of Valencia, Spain. There's a, a tradition that they were having an insect infestation uh, in their farming community and bats came in and saved the day. So you'll see that's actually a bat on top of their coat of arms. And to the next slide. And here's their soccer club. So their soccer club even has uh, a bat symbol. Of course, in our uh, modern culture, Dracula, who, sort of put a bat name out for bats, but anyway, Stella Luna, uh, Janelle is an author who lives up in Carlsbad. Actually, she started recording bats with her uh, ultrasonic microphone fairly recently. Uh, Batman, uh, lower right are Cub Scouts, our Boy Scout merit badges. I just like to draw your attention to the center bottom. In China, bats are good luck. Um, called the five bats of happiness, uh, five bats. They appear on tapestry, uh, ceramics, uh, silver coins, and, uh, and they're thought to bring good fortune. We can talk a little bit about that later if there are questions about COVID. So how do bats benefit us? Insect control, uh, you couldn't really do better, uh, you know, pound for pound. Someone somehow back in the 60s measured how many mosquito-sized insects, uh, a little brown bat was consuming and it was at a rate of about a thousand an hour and they'll eat half their body weight in insects a night. Pollinate plants. I touched on uh, desert species and pollination of cactus. So most of the columnar cactus, saguaro, organ pipe, et cetera, they have white blossoms that open at night. Often a bat is associated with pollinating them. Uh, they also pollinate fruit. So banana, papaya, guava, 
I also mentioned agave, so really important pollinators. Uh, one of the adaptations of plants and bats coevolution is that there are some flowers, again, they're white, but opening at night, they have a shape that is parabolic and basically reflects bat, the bat's call. And it's you know, sort of like a beacon saying, you know, come and pollinate me. The bats aren't there to pollinate, they're there to get the nectar. Dispersed seeds, um, this is more for fruit bats, which we don't have, but in places like the Brazilian rainforest, et cetera, uh, bats eat fruits of not just human eat edible fruits, but fruits of flowering uh, trees. And when they fly, they drop the seed wherever and a very big factor in reforestation. Medical research, uh, one of them is uh, the, they have a chemical in their blood that the vampire bats, at least, that prevent clotting. And so there's been research for how to use those for surgeries. Uh, more recently, bats are very disease resistant, uh, able to, in their physiology, sort of encapsulate disease rather than contend with it with like antibody reactions such as we have. And scientists are very interested in how they do that and how that might be applicable to human health. And not so much these days, but in days of old, guano fertilizer, uh, many of the historic uh, mines and caves were far, including Carlsbad was originally uh, extensively uh, exploited for guano. So threats, uh, true of many wildlife uh, circumstances these days, habitat, particularly foraging habitat. Some of you may have heard of the insect apocalypse. So insect populations are way down. Maybe that's great if they're insects that bother us, but a lot of insects both benefit the wildlife that eats them. Many of them are pollinators and such. So that's sort of a, a double whammy for the bats. Destruction of roost sites uh, here in San Diego, it would be palm trees, trimming palm trees. That's where Western yellow bats tend to uh, spend their quiet times. Uh, pesticides get into the food chain through the insects and of course into the bats. Intentionally killed parts of the world where they're hunted, uh, harvested as food, uh, or they're killed just because people don't like bats. Often with things like explosives blowing up mines and such to, to kill them off. White nose syndrome is a disease. I'll show that in the chart in a moment. The little the photo on the upper right are little brown bats. They get this uh, fungus growth. It came from uh, Europe. They thought it was brought in by cave explorers and it started in New York State. Uh, what happens is this is a, a fungus the bats have no uh, resistance to. It grows on and think of it like a whole body um, athlete's foot or something and it bothers them, they wake up and coming out of the low, metabol low metabolism of hibernation, wake up, but there's no food. They might go back to sleep, but it bothers them again. So they basically burn up their fat reserves before the spring and food is available. Huge problem, we've got 90% and more die-offs Little brown bat is now an endangered species in Canada, whereas it used to be the most common bat. Uh, similar circumstances in Eastern states. It's spreading across the country. It's in Washington state. I think maybe Northern California. They were worried about getting to Texas. Uh, so researchers all through the country are studying ways to both uh, prevent it, find out how certain individuals resist it, what are some things we can do to counter this very uh, terrible tragedy? And in wind turbines, for some reason, especially hoary bats or migrators, they tend to be attracted to wind turbines by the sound. So there are efforts there to put basically sound distractors and until the bats go elsewhere, rather than find bunches of dead bats at the base of windmills. Uh, here's the map of White nose syndrome, you can find information, latest information on the web about this. Uh, my map's a little bit 2018, so I'm a little behind the times, but it started over here in New York and has continued to spread westward. 
field techniques. Um, so acoustic monitoring, we've already talked about that. That's a way we can leave acoustic monitors out for extended periods of time. That's what Chase and the team are doing at Boulder Creek and the, the other properties. And then look at the data later on, discern which species are around. Uh, you get some feel for how many are there, but you never really can tell. Is it one bat who's just flying laps in front of your recorder? Or is it 100 bats that just made one pass? Mist netting, mist nets are sort of like uh, volleyball nets very, or fish net, very fine. Uh, use those uh, to do hand surveys, measurements, uh, maybe DNA samples, et cetera. And then roof surveys, which is what we did at Boulder Creek. Uh, this is a different cave up in Lagunas, but the, mine in the Lagunas, but this is a bat in, uh, at Boulder Creek. So go in, try to do it in non-invasive times and just see who's around. How to be a friend about. So I support Project Wildlife, uh, which uh, as a service to the community will intake bats that may have fallen in your swimming pool or gotten in your yard or your house uh, and assess whether or not they're healthy, releasable. And we have rehabilitation regimens. It's under permit with uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and we're really there to, you know, do our small part to, to help bats succeed. A little note at the bottom, please, please, please don't personally touch or pick up a sick or injured bat. There's always a risk of, of rabies as with any wild animal. And if it's on the ground, it's higher chance it's sick and it's probably frightened. Uh, they have very sharp little teeth and uh, yeah, you don't want to expose yourself. So the safe way to do that, in addition to calling Project Wildlife, I have a number on the next slide, is have gloves on, uh, maybe use a shoe box, cardboard box. You know, so basically capture them without coming in contact with them. Uh, and I already talked a little bit about the bat team. There's the number 619 wild They're actually pretty close to, uh, the Project Wildlife is very close to the River Park Foundation offices. This is a hoary bat that we rescued. Some of you may know Cindy Myers. She was up by Rainbow. And this was one of the bats that actually landed on a ship off of Monterey, <laughs> a research vessel in a, in a bad storm. and. Uh, came down to us, got a uh, uh, little bit of re-nourished re re uh, nourishment and allowed it uh, for a form of its wing to heal and released it. And next I'd like to show you what a release looks like. This is a very large bat as bats go. And there she goes. So I think we're getting close to seven. I know we started a little late. We had some technical issues. But let me just talk a little bit about Townsend's big eared bat. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this, is, this is the reason there is a gate guard at the Boulder Creek property. It's because of this bat, the species. The one in the center is actually taken there and during the survey, a photograph of, of one of them. It doesn't look much like the one on the right or the, you know, the other three photos when they're sleeping, obviously it's upside down, uh, folded up, but they also roll their large ears back, maybe like a little bit of a blanket. And, uh, they, and then they're about the size of a golf ball when they're like that. This is a roost in another part uh, of the desert transition uh, between Anza Borrego and the Lagunas, very uh, significant nursery and this is what an acoustic uh, recording of a Townsend's look like. Uh, again, medium size, caves and mines, and uh, 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 again, a species of special concern. Again, that's what warranted the gate at Boulder. So we're here in the COVID area. That's why I'm not presenting this in an amphitheater or uh, you know, in a camp, uh, campground or whatever. Uh, Bats are natural hosts to coronaviruses. You'll see 
uh, quite a bit of uh, literature that something very similar to it is in horseshoe bats in China. Nothing like it has been detected in North America, uh, thank goodness. And of course, other wildlife can host, be host and can be uh, sort of intermediaries to the, the human situation, which is what that third bullet is. That was an early assumption. Uh, the word's still out on, on how it really got in the human population, uh, but live animal markets are not really a good place for, uh, from a point of view of spreading disease. The animals are all stressed, they're in that unnatural uh, proximity to each other, and so you're kind of asking for trouble. Left health, you know, left wild, unprotected, undisturbed, or protected and undisturbed, very unlikely to, uh, to be contracting anything like that from a bat. Uh, I will mention that we had to change our protocols in this country so that bat researchers were not giving our bats coronavirus. In other words, the other direction, because we didn't want it to get in the bat population. Well, I'll skip the quiz. We already had that part. A couple little quotes, and then we'll have some more questions. So, Love Shelf Silverstein, turn on the dark. I'm afraid of the light. And bats are even in Shakespeare, the tempest. On the bat's back, I do fly after summer merrily. So, with that note, uh, Jen, do we have some more questions? So we did have, yes, we have a couple more questions coming in and I'm sure additional ones will probably come after these. Um, but Chase had told us that we've recorded 15 of the 22 species in San Diego so far in our preserves, um, but could all 22 potentially be found in the San Diego River watershed? Ooh, um, well, of the 22, the Mexican long tongue it's really only been found on the coast and it's considered a migrator. Uh, some think it might be the pollinator of the Shah's agaves that grow along the coast. So I wouldn't expect that one to be in the river. But because the river goes from sea level up into the lagunas, yes, you could have pretty much any species along the river. The, I don't know if pallids have been recorded there. They're certainly in the desert and on the coast or in places like uh, Camp Pendleton. So they could be. So yeah, that would be that would be kind of a fun study. I could get together with Chase and we can make up a slide sort of like mine that says how many recorded in Anza Brego and have our little bat yeah. sheet for the foundation. That sounds great. We're, we're definitely excited to continue to expand our research. Um, we also had a couple of questions about bat boxes. I know that's, I think that's usually something that you typically uh, cover a bit. So one person asked, can you recommend a certain type of bat box to home the locals in? And another person asked, what about bat boxes? Are they helpful or harmful? Okay, so I'm gonna slide, I'm gonna go down my slides here. There's a, there's a bat box. So bat box is, I mean, they're pretty simple. They're a place where bats can roost during the day. Um, there are different construction designs. Uh, if you look on the Bat Conservation International website, you can both get plans, you can get recommendations for products that meet their standards. Uh, they need to be weatherproof, so uh, they have a lid at the top so rain doesn't get in. Uh, they're essentially parallel, parallel boards to, and, and, and roughened, or maybe there's some material on it so the bats can grip with their, their claws. Um, the question about their benefits, yes, they can be very beneficial, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean bats are going to go for them. So that's a frustration for many. You build a bat box and you don't see any bats. Uh, it might not have been in the right place or they have better options. Uh, one thing to mention about bat boxes is because bats are so long lived, uh, you're making a commitment. You're going to put a bat box out there and raise, you know, if you're successful, have generations of bats there. And that's a 20, 30 year proposition, uh, not, you know, just a hobby for six months. So be want to commit to it. Other things you'll see on the BCI website is you want to put these on posts. So, and I'm not just stick them on a fence because you don't want cats to get to them, uh, raccoons, other predators. 
Uh, owls are also an issue. The final thing I'll mention is color matters. Uh, and it's all about where where you are. So if you're in a very warm place, you want a light colored box. If you're in a cold place, it would be black like this. Intermediate is green. And again, you can get that information from the, the websites. So one story about bat boxes, I, I had my friend Charlie Van Tassel, that's who I learned bat photography from, has a place up by Eagle Peak, uh, south of Vail Lake. And he's got bat boxes on each end of his house. The one on the north side, which is the cooler, uh, probably has 200 bats in it. The one on the south side, same bat house, has never had a bat in it. So, you know, it's a little bit of a, a, a lottery on whether you're going to be successful, but they are helpful. They're a great project uh, for, you know, like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. I just read about a Girl Scout project in BCI's magazine. So very worthwhile, and it's a way to help with habitat loss and options for roof sites. Ooh, that was a long, long answer on bat boxes. No, I think that was a great answer. Thank you. And I, I, we had a couple of questions, and I know that's often one that comes up as well. So thank you for that. Chase put the link to the um, BCI bat house information in the chat as well. Uh, we had another question that says, I used to see bats all summer in my backyard in La Mesa, but have not seen any in two years. Is that common? Are there less now than in the past? Thank you for this informative presentation. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I used to go and, and visually, uh, let's say monitor is overstating it, but watch bats at the, at the pond at the Scripps Ranch Library, primarily Yuma myotis. And there were scads of them and they like to forage along the water. <clears throat> I haven't seen any in about six months. So I don't know what's going on there, <clears throat> whether their nearby roost got displaced um, <clears throat> bat populations are down in certain parts of the country and the world. Part of that may be insects. Uh, again, I mentioned that <clears throat> insect apocalypse. Um, but for La Mesa, I don't know. I, you know, drought conditions can change things. It's often about food. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll ask Drew about that. He might have some <clears throat> later data. And I could get that answer back to you, Jen. All right, thank you. Again, we can, we can follow up with Judy. Um, and then we had another question that just came in. You mentioned plants that co-evolved for bat pollination. Are moonflowers a species that promote bat pollination? And are there any native plants that we can plant to support bat species? Ooh, that's sort of like uh, planting milkweed for monarch butterflies. Um, I don't know because the species that like the cactus are sort of indigenous to where the cactus naturally grows. Um, one thing that has been an increase in bats in San Diego <clears throat> is Western yellow bats that didn't used to live here 40 years ago. That's thought <clears throat> to be associated with uh, planting fan palms. You know, the decorative palms and for landscaping gave them a place. So they've kind of moved over from Arizona to this place. So that would be trickier. I don't think the pollination, unless you want to do agave farms and, and import some <laughs> Mexican short nose bats, that would, that would probably be a stretch to have a much of an impact. But probably any, any planting of native species is good for the general ecosystem and insects and that kind of thing. So the roundabout way. Yeah, there you go. Be good. <laughs> Thing, this, but. Yeah, at this point, I'd like to show some videos. I know we're over in time a little bit, um, but I'm willing to stick around as long as anyone has questions. They're short videos, and I think they give you a good feel for things I couldn't show on the slides. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I think if hopefully some people can stay around and, and check out these videos. We did have one, I think, a relatively quick question, but if it's longer, you can follow up afterwards as well is any recommendations on where and how to safely bat watch in San Diego? To bat watch? Yeah. Um, well, when, when we lift restrictions, I lead uh, walks at Mission Trails. <clears throat> and I usually start there at the Bushy Hill parking lot at the East End and we walk to Old Mission Dam. 
So <clears throat> that's one of the most reliable places to see bats. Uh, at the beginning, you'll see canyon bats when it's still light. Then the Yuma myotis will, will move in and you can watch them by flashlight as they dip to the water. And if you have an acoustic recorder, there are big browns and uh, pocketed free tails. So that's a great spot. Another place to look for bats is around sport field lighting. So I think Penasquitos, uh, I'm sure there are some down at Rob Field, but that same context, because especially Mexican free tails, they like to fly circuits up at the level of the lights because they're attracting bugs. So at Penasquitos, I've watched them, I can put my recorder out and I can actually hear them catching the insect because they go brr, brr, brr. So that's a kick. That's very cool. And yeah, and hopefully we'll be starting some uh, potential bat walks or at least some bat field trips at our preserves and along the river as well. So hopefully we can find time to coordinate and get everyone involved as well. All right, I'll let you show some videos. Okay, here we go. So the first <clears throat> video is to show a bat in flight. This is a big brown bat. Sound over, notice that it's flying with its mouth open. It's echo located. If it had its mouth closed, those sounds wouldn't be coming out. You also see this is a big brown bat and how small it is in the researcher's hand. Two other things to note there, uh, sort of like when if you watch a cheetah running, head is almost locked on. If you're, you know, you're zooming in on an insect or whatever, you don't want your head bobbing up and down. Uh, also, you saw the sharp teeth. I'm always asked by children about that. And, uh, you know, I usually pose it back as a question, but think about what they're eating. They're eating insects, have hard exoskeletons, so those sharp teeth are so they can puncture the, the uh, shell. The, the outer case of the insects. Next one, I want to show the pallid bat. Now this one has some loud volume, so you might want to be ready to turn it down if it's too loud. And this is a bat that has a different hunting strategy. Slicing through the shadows scanning for prey hidden under a cloak of darkness. Bats are masters of the night sky, thanks to their twin superpowers, flight and echolocation, using sound waves to find prey. So what the heck is this one doing? It's hunting on the ground and not flying. Kind of an undignified way to catch a meal, isn't it? I mean, for a bat. Turns out echolocation, that natural sonar bats use, isn't the killer technique you'd think. Like it's not actually that sneaky. We can't hear the frequency that bats put out, but to a moth, it's louder than a scream. More like a jet taking off. It's kind of a dead giveaway. And some prey have found ways to fight back. This tiger moth has loaded up on a diet of toxic plants that make him disgusting to eat. A fact he broadcasts with warning clicks from an organ called a timbal. The same one cicadas used to sing. Bats learn as pups to stay away.
And these hawk moths can scramble bat sonar by emitting clicks from their genitals. It's a dogfight that bats are starting to lose. That's why some, like this pallid bat, are changing the game. She still echolocates, but only to navigate. And she keeps the volume low. She's a whispering bat. When it's time to hunt, she goes into stealth mode. Her ears point down, where scorpions and crickets are milling in the loose earth. And she listens. Look at those ears again. They're huge relative to her tiny skull. They do a great job of capturing and amplifying sound, especially the low-pitched noises of scurrying prey. And see that funny flap? It's called the tragus. They provide extra information about where a sound is coming from. We have them too, but in a bat, they're way bigger. And the bat has a final card to play here. She's immune to scorpion venom. But the sting rattles her a little. It's not as graceful as the high-flying aerobatics, but hey, it works. All right, so now I have one, this is a very short clip showing what an outflight from a cave looks like, but more importantly, the phenomenon when they rise up to catch the insects at 10,000 feet over Texas. We'll see a baby born at the beginning of it. With 40 million bats, this is now the biggest colony in the world. Yet, at the moment of birth, each mother and baby are on their own. Like a safety rope, the umbilical cord connects them, but not for long. They've got just one hour to learn each other's unique smell and call before the cord breaks. It's a lesson no baby can afford to miss. Because then the mother must leave it. To survive, each baby must stay put, clinging to the ceiling for dear life. For down below them, triggered by the urine from the bats, a mass of flesh-eating bugs are hatching. In an ironic twist of fate, the colony creates its own killers. As dusk falls, the mothers begin the night hunt. They've got just a few hours before they must return to their babies. But with 20 million new mouths to feed, where on earth can they find enough food to sustain them? a mile above the Texan hills. It'll be a race against time, but the colony has a very clear and specific target. Now over a hundred million bats invade the sky as other colonies join forces. They're all on a collision course. At 10,000 feet, the bats fan out to face another airborne battalion flying towards them. It's billions of moths heading to their summer feeding grounds. 
Incredibly, just when they need a massive food supply, 250 tons of flying insects arrive on the scene. Okay, I'm gonna skip the end of it. We see a baby fall down. <laughs> um, my last video is one here at Script Ranch at the pond, uh, just to see what it might look like if you go out bat watching at night. Uh, on the last video, I just mentioned that before we knew they were bats, there were weather stations in that part of the country, Texas primarily, where they were starting to see thunderstorms, only there weren't any thunderstorms. And that's, they eventually discovered, well, it's those bats that are coming out of Bracken Cave and the other caves. So this next one is taken a couple of years ago, but these are Yuma Myotis at the library pond. You would see something similar to this at Mission Trail uh, in the pools just above Old Mission Dam. Maybe not quite so many. And I won't play this all the way through. I'll go back to any last minute questions. So I'm going to stop share. So Jen, do we have any more questions? That was awesome. Thank you for sharing those videos too. Um, let's see, it looks like we have one more or a combination, one more combination question. Uh, so do nectar eating bats have teeth? Yes, all bats have teeth. All bats have teeth. And do they, do all bats have a fairly diverse diet or are they pretty limited in what each species eats? Um, they're pretty specialized in what they eat. So the insectivores might have a different variety of insects on the menu, especially Mexican free tails, but they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of designed together for whatever their food source is. Um, the, the pallid bat we saw there, um, I mean, they, I think they can hover and catch insects as well, but generally they're going after insects that have landed on the ground or on foliage. California leaf milk bats are similar to that too. All right, and then we had a lot of comments about how wonderful this has been and thanking you as well. So I think that we are, looks like we were are done with the comments. We did uh, our questions. Um, we did have one person ask if we will be sending out a copy of this presentation afterwards. So we will email out a copy of the presentation. But I think that that uh, wraps it up. Thank you so much, Don, for taking the time to be here tonight. I know uh, from the first meeting that you've had with us at the River Park Foundation, I think about a year or two ago, I've become a bit bat obsessed and I find a way to work bats into every field trip and conversation that I have and seeing them with the little microphone that you can just hook up into your iPad or into your phone is, is really incredible. Have that out in the field and you see something on the screen and you look up and there's a bat above you. So uh, that's been really incredible too. And, and thank you to everyone for coming to the first of our San Diego River Speaker Series. We're really excited to do these quarterly uh, with other exciting experts too. And thank you to everybody who has supported our bat uh, conservation, conservation efforts thus far. Marina will also be sending out additional details about how you can get involved in ways that you can help us out with our conservation efforts as well. So thank you everyone. And thank you again to our adopted bat and conservation sponsors and we will be seeing you soon. So thank you, thank you, have a good evening. Thank you, Don, that was amazing. Bye.